entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. The Breeders Academy proudly presents Bread to Perfection with Kenny Troiano. A show for serious breeders. Whether you are looking to create a new strain or simply improve an old one, you have come to the right place. Daddy, I want more chicken. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, here's your host, Kitty Triano. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Bread to Perfection. My name is Kenny Troiano, and this, my friends, is the podcast devoted to helping you become a better breeder and taking your strain to the next level. That's right, my friends. It doesn't matter if you are brand new to breeding or you've been breeding for many years. There is something all of us can do to improve our fowl for future generations. You have an emergency. I need a bambolet. Who is this? Joe. Okay. Where do you need us? I'm in a phone booth. Okay, sir, did you call through 911? Uh, no. Okay, Joe, I need a location. What street are you on? I'm in a phone booth at the stop and go. Let me tell you, I'm going down the road, driving my car, minding my own business, and I'm here, jumping out and hit my car. Sir, are you injured? Now, let me tell you, I get out and pick the deer up. I thought he's dead. I put the deer in my back seat, and I'm driving down the road and minding my own business. Then I woke up and bit me and it done kicked my car. And I'm in the phone booth. The deer bit me in the neck. A big dog came up and bit me in the leg. I hit him with the tire iron, so I got a hurt leg and a deer bit me in the neck. And the dog won't let me out of the phone booth because he wants the deer. Now, who gets the deer, me or the dog? <laughs> Okay, welcome to another episode of Bread to Perfection. I'm Kenny Troiano. I'm here with my co-host, Nancy and Frank. What's going on, you guys? You got the deer. The dog or the guy? I don't know. They, they never bugs? answered this question. <laughs> yeah, I thought the show was about uh, the hen or the cock, not the, the, <laughs> the deer or the guy. When I first heard that, Kenny, I was like, oh, crap. I hope that's the PG version. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> now... I showed Frank both versions. I showed him the R-rated version, and I showed him the PG version that I edited down. Did you notice the dog barking at the end? I added yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty cool. I thought that wasn't in it from the original. Yeah, it was amazing how I was able to cut out all the cuss words and everything. I shortened it quite a yeah. bit. You cut out quite a bit of the language part. Yeah. Quite a bit. I mean, Yeah, it was pretty colorful. <laughs> <laughs> how do I say this? Frank pulled a fast one on me the other day. Mm. He tricked me into critiquing my own bird. Oh, yeah. That's and right. I'll never forgive him for it. But it was kind of funny because what he did was he sent me this picture here. And he said, give me your honest opinion, Kenny. What do you think about this confirmation? No hose bar. Yeah. So I opened it up. I says, oh, yeah. Okay. So I looked it over and I said, the wing could be down just a fraction. But overall, I think it's a good bird. I thought it had really good type because I was actually amazed because I don't see very many what I think is a good birds when it comes to type. So then he sends me this. And I'm going, holy crap. Okay, so <laughs> is this the same bird? that You took a silhouette of my bird, and he was letting me know that Amanda had done it that evening and then sent it to me. But he had me critiquing my own freaking bird. I told Amanda, I said, Kenny is so critical when it comes from type and confirmation. That he is going after his own bird. I said, that is a true judge in my eyes. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. I was like, damn. I had to do that. I was just going to send it to him and say, here you go. Amanda done one of your birds. How do you like it? And I thought, hmm, I think I'll have a little bit of fun out of it. Just see what he says. Just kind of hit him on the blind side and see what his remarks would be. I got a good kick out of that. And I looked it over and gave it my best try, too. So that, that was the biggest <laughs> thing I noticed. The wing could have been down just a little bit, but I didn't expect it to be my bird. That was funny. 
So, <laughs> yeah, I went through all your birds, and that one just kind of struck out. I thought it would make a really good silhouette for us to use for the members as far as showing them type, as far as confirmation. So, with Kenny's permission, he's giving me permission to do some more of his. So, hopefully, we'll have some more coming out. And I, I just thought it, it's a good teaching tool for the members actually to be able to see that and learn what the true curvature of the type confirmation is supposed to be on the birds. I think it's a great teaching instrument. Now, I sent you one where the bird was really tall. And yeah. If you can do that one, that would be a good one. because um, He's on there. Yeah, good. Because I want good birds, but I also want a comparison. I want some birds mm -hmm. that are out of type. And like you said, they make great teaching projects. So we can put them on there and give people an idea of what the type is. Because there's a lot of people who just don't understand what the right type and confirmation of the bird. They don't even know there's a difference between type and confirmation. Sure. And we always say that type is just what you see here. Let's say you take a picture of the side of the bird and just take a pen and ink it all out so that you see the basic overall outline of the bird. And if you look at every breed, no matter whether it's a game fowl, a seal, American game, Old English, Spanish, Leghorn, Rhode Island Red, Plymouth Rock, they all have a unique shape to them. A unique outline which makes them represent their breed without that specific outline they don't represent their breed frank and i are always sharing pictures every now and then we get lucky and we find one we think is a good type and we share those but most of the time we're finding birds that are out of type and we share those as well and we put them in our folders we call in fact what do i call that i forgot the wall of shame the wall of shame that's right <laughs> i don't know why i forgot that we call it the wall of shame he has this folder i have mine and we use them and we did a master's class video on confirmation for our members, and I lost count how many people said they really enjoyed that because we showed what the true confirmation should be and why. If you look at the type, it's the outline of the bird, and that represents its breed. But when you look at the confirmation, it's basically all the parts in their proper proportions in their proper places. So that it's a little bit different. And once you understand that, it makes selecting your brood fowl a lot easier. Because if I were to describe the proper confirmation of a bird, you would think just by describing it that this would be okay. I kind of tricked the members, okay? I kind of tricked them. I had some fun with it. But uh, the one that was a bird that I had actually raised, but I kept him to do what I'd done with him. His legs was sort of out in front of him. He was borderline squirrel-tailed, and he, he had huge legs. He wasn't stork-legged. He still had the bends in his legs, but he was really, really tall. And I let everybody look at it, and everybody was really two birds. One with correct confirmation, type confirmation. The other one, not so good. A lot of people went after that bird because that's what you see on social media. The ones that people go crazy are the big, tall, lanky-looking type chickens. But once I blacked it out, they was able to see the difference between the two of them. And, and when you sent that silhouette to me, my first thought was you just sent me a picture that, that you found, and finally we found one with a good outline. And then after I gave you my critique, I sent it, and then I started thinking, because I was thinking about your birds, I kind of thought it was one of your birds. So yeah. I thought you were trying to get me to critique your bird because you wanted me to give you an honest opinion, but I didn't expect it to be mine. But when you look at this bird here, if I were to tell you what the confirmation should be, just by explaining it to you, you would think this bird would have it. But the problem is, he does have the right confirmation when you think of all the parts in their proper proportions and their proper place. But when you outline the bird, you realize that the type is just way off. Same thing with the hen. If you look at the hen, her carriage is completely off. The legs are way back. She's kind of flat on the back overall. There's a lot of things going on with that hen. That happened to be the seed fowl that I started with. And after 30 years of breeding and selecting and improving my blood, without even adding outside blood, my birds look like what you see on the bottom. Now, you see that hen with the carriage way in the back? Get a good look at that because I'm going to say something here that's kind of funny. As I was listening to someone else online who has their own show, and they <laughs> they were trying to describe to people what the proper confirmation was. And their idea of confirmation wasn't that when you're talking about a low station bird, that it's a bird that has lower station. They actually said that for a bird that has low station, it's a bird that has his legs way back. And if he has high stations, the legs are way forward. And that's not true at all. When you're looking at birds that are either high, low, or medium, that's your station, of course. But when you look at the legs that are either too far back or too far forward, that's not a station problem. That's a carriage problem. Okay, that's poor carriage. 
So it's that kind of information I think are misleading people. They don't really understand. They take that as gospel and then they run with it. And it's so bad because they're going out and they're selecting their birds accordingly. They're selecting birds. Oh, I don't want low station. The carriage is back. Frank, how often do you actually see a carriage where the legs are that far back that you could actually call it low station? We all know what low station is. So that kind of advice is really bad. So what they end up doing, they want tall station. They start selecting birds with legs where they're way forward. And before you know it, their strain is out of kilter. They've got the wrong type. Eventually, they're going to have the wrong confirmation. They're breeding the wrong birds. I just thought about that when I saw the hen that way and when I heard what they said. I just thought it straightened that out, but yeah. Can I ask you a question on that? So if you have a cock that has historic legged, are his legs forward? Are they underneath the carriage the right way? They're just super tall? They could be anywhere. They could be anywhere. They could be anywhere. Yeah. It's just the length of leg is just no, really tall. But you're talking about two different things. Okay. When we're okay. talking about short legged, he could be a short station bird. He could be a tall station bird. What we're talking about is a bird. Well, typically they are taller. But we're talking about a bird where the legs are straight up and down, almost like a two by four. Okay. No bend. Oh, instead of bent, like with it's the, to be. the proper okay. angulation. So if his legs are forward or back and he's stork like it, and I've seen both ways, by the way, then he's got poor carriage. Now, what I will say that when the legs are far back, you tend to have a flat back that goes with it, which destroys the conformation and type completely. And then when they're way forward, it's like the back is tilted too much which destroys the conformation of type 2. So you want something in the middle. Of course, you want the legs properly placed under the bird that supports the weight of the bird with the proper angulation. So that would take care of the type, the conformation, and keep them from being stilty on top of it. Yeah. I don't know if you remember it or not, Kenny. I can't remember if you sent it to me or if I sent it to you. But a year or so ago, somebody made a chart. I don't know who made it, but it was floating around on social yeah. media in a lot of groups. And it had... High station chickens, legs in the front, had medium station chickens, legs in the center, and had short legged chickens in the rear of the bird. And a lot of people got a hold of that chart and they thought it was gospel. And that's what started the virus. Maybe. Now that you say that, I do remember that chart. I'd like to get my hands on that chart again and we could talk about it for our members when we start talking about confirmation. That is a course that I'll revisit quite a bit, hopefully once a year if we can manage it. And maybe that's what they did too. They saw that chart thought it was the way it should be, and then they start teaching it. Well, they didn't know what they were talking about. So anyways, I just thought I'd mention that. Frank pulled a fast one on me, but I think it was kind of funny overall, so I thought it would be a good idea to share it. For you guys watching the show, we're going to go for an hour, and then we're going to go into the back end for our members, and we're going to do the members-only version. Yeah, that, well, I was going to say that second hour, me and you and Nancy, we get to talk with the members about anything and everything. And here it's a little bit different. We don't get to go deep into what we're talking about. Yeah. But on that last hour, we really, it's no hose bars. No rating on it. We say what we want. We go in as deep as we want. The members get to ask some <laughs> questions. And I think that's helped so much as far as with the coaching calls. So since we started yeah. doing this, I still get some coaching calls, but nothing like I was getting before. You're so yeah. right. Matter of fact, I did a coaching call uh, yesterday, and he said the same thing. I still had a few questions. I've been watching all the master's class videos, and you've been pretty much answering all my questions. I've been marking them off. Mm -hmm. And he only had a actually a few questions for me that day. But that's what I'm hearing is that they're scheduling a coaching call. They go to watch the videos, and then they call me back, or they actually message me back and say, oh, you answered my question. I'm good. <laughs> Let me do the videos. So I see that my name has changed to R2-D2, a.k.a. The Boss. You want to explain The Boss part of it? Because I hadn't Nan noticed that until they mentioned it. Yeah, I George, George had said something about it. I hadn't even noticed. Yeah. Nancy has a whole new setup. You can tell by why her eyes are pointing up and down and around. <laughs> yeah, and I'm high going all over the place now. I have two huge screens. Yeah, so she's got all these things on her screens, and it's going to take some training, but she's kind of filling in Promoted. the producer spot. <laughs> and she's got the outline here. She's got the stream yard here. She's got Google over here. Swing the camera around and show you guys. It's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> well, you could. Nancy, just take the camera and turn it. I don't know. She I'm got a promotion. Sick. Yeah, she's she got, got a promotion. promotion. If you can see, yeah. I got a screen here and a screen over here. And it's huge. As you can see that. <laughs> 
So I know exactly that's, where she's at too. Yeah. That's why I'm the boss. Yeah. So we've gave her a big project. So it's going to take her a while to get used to doing things and pulling things up and she can share screens. So little by little, we're going to give her more and I'm getting ready to buy her a similar mixer like I got here where she can do sound effects. And the reason she's the boss is she can mute Ben Kenny. Yeah. I can. That's I didn't even know she's that. the boss. Yeah. yeah. We give her too much power, don't we? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know I could do that. So oh, yeah, you can. if you want to watch the entire show, make sure to join the Breeders Academy. That way you'll be ready to watch the members only version. The good news is the website is open for enrollment. You know, it's funny. I was going to shut down. We, we hardly ever leave the membership open very long. We usually open it for what? A few weeks at the most. And then we shut it down and we were opening it like three times a year because I want to keep the, the number of members manageable to make sure I can handle it. And we've been doing really good, but they're steadily coming in, which is kind of cool. So we just kind of left it open. Eventually, I'll probably shut down the website, but we're going to leave it open a little bit longer. You should say that differently. How? You, you should say that, not shut down the website, yeah. just close the doors for new enrollment. Yeah. So it is open for new enrollment. So go to the registration page. Just go to www.breedersacademy.com. Click to become a member. It'll take you to the registration page. You can sign up, become a member. There's all kinds of information. You're going to love it. It's a great website. I'm so proud of it. We're going to get going here pretty soon. One more announcement. Make sure to join the newsletter, which is called the Breeders Bulletin. Again, go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. You're going to get a lot of free tips, free eBooks, and we provide a lot of new opportunities for new subscribers. And even if you're not going to become a member, Go ahead and join the newsletter. It's free. Everything's free about it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, we'll provide you with the roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. I urge you to check it out. You've got nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30 day money back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. I hope to see you there. So let's get started. Okay, so on with the show. This is going to be an interesting one. I've been doing this a lot on Facebook to get people's opinion and see how they answer it. And what's interesting is you can tell who the members are by the way they answer it, which makes me so proud. And then you can tell who's not a member with their different answers, which tend to lean very much towards what we've always seen in the past, which is, I hate to say it, but mostly connected old wives' tales, superstitions. And the members not only give their answers, but they actually give reasons for their answer, which is really cool too. Members got the answer. They knew the answer pretty much. So they always do. <laughs> always do. So we're going to talk about the uh, difference between the cock and the hen, talk about who's more important, who's more valuable. And then for the members, we're going to discuss the main effects of mitochondrial DNA. So that's what we'll talk about. We'll continue the conversation between who's more important or who's more valuable, which is the cock and the hen, and then we're going to go into mitochondrial DNA. So I think you'll get a lot out of that one, too. And the answers we got was very interesting. Gave me a good insight of how people think. So the question is, who's more important, the cock or hen? And who is more valuable, Frank? What do you think? Well, this has been a huge debate for how many years now, Kenny? For Since as long as the chickens guess, have been around. Since yeah. I've been a kid and knew what a chicken was. And everyone has their own opinion based yep. off their experience. But here's the thing. Who's right? Who's wrong? That's right. So we're going to give you our opinion. And as Frank always says, our opinion is more based on the science. So we're not just guessing. We're not just speculating. We're basing it off the physiology of the bird, 
the biology of the bird, the reproduction of the bird, how the bird fits into the breeding program, the offspring they produce and why. So we're going to dig into that. And I have a feeling we'll probably talk mostly about it on the back end. But when I looked at the response on Facebook, some people said the cock, some people said the hen, some people said both. And I find that when they talk about the cock and they give the reasoning, you can see that it's based on superficial answers. Because it's the old wives' tales of superstitions that we've always cling on why the cock is more important. But other than the fact that it's a beautiful bird, has a certain function, depending on the breed, they have different functions, different purposes. So people tend to cling to the cock. And then you look at the hen, and a lot of breeders have said, oh, definitely the hen. But they could never explain why, Frank. Hardly anybody could tell me why the hen was good. They just instinctively felt that the hen was better. I've always said this, Kenny, and I believe it with all my heart. And I want people to really listen to this. When a breeder can judge a hen as well or as good as a cock, it's going to raise your breeding to another level. It's going to take you to another level. But yet, a lot of people, while they do, any old hen I do, but I want this cock. They always put more emphasis on the cock. And as breeders, we can't do that. It has to be on both. It has to be. Yeah. It has to be. I lost count how many times back in the day when I used to sell birds. I don't sell birds anymore for so many reasons. But they would come over here and they would spend so much time trying to find the right cock out of the ones that I had for sale. And then we'd start getting into a conversation and I was like, okay, which hens do you want? I had a big pen just filled with hens. And, oh, just whatever. I go, no, I want you to select them. I want you to be happy with them. And they would just send their kid in there. This is how stupid I was. I just let people come on my farm, send their kid right into the pen. Thank God I didn't run into a problem. But anyways, they would send their hens right into the pen. And basically their whatever. Kids. What's that? Their kids. Well, I'm just uh-huh. saying, they still have germs on their feet, okay? No, no, you said send their hens. I said no, Oh, I'm kids. sorry. Okay. Send their <laughs> kids into the pen. And whatever hens they caught is what they took with them. They didn't even hardly look at them. Because they felt like, all I'm looking for is a nice rooster, a nice cock, that has what I'm looking for, that appeals to my eye. The hen is just secondary to the whole equation. Superficial. All she, yeah, superficial. All she's going to do is produce chicks. The cock is the one that determines the quality of chick, which is completely wrong. And I lost count of how many times that was happening. I was like, okay. Did you answer the question, which one is more important, the hen or the, we're not, or the cock? We're on the, we're we're on the way. You're, you're not yeah. No, I'm not okay, going to say can exactly. I, can I ask you a hey, question? Let me, let me say this first before you go <laughs> okay. there, because I don't want you to get ahead of ourselves, is okay. that the cock has good qualities and bad qualities. The hen has good qualities and bad qualities. And we're going to dive into the pros and cons of both, but there's some things the cock has that the hen will never be able to produce. And there's some things about the hen that the cock will never be able to produce. I have my opinion, but it's going to be up to you whether you see by the way we explain it, who's more valuable. Okay, now your turn, Nancy. Don't blow the secret. (laughs) (laughs) The answer is... Yeah, I'm going to knock you... uh, I can hey, turn you boss. off, too, by the way, the you know. I, want, right? I can turn you uh, off, too. <laughs> I can turn myself off. <laughs> a question, with the cock or the hen, either one of them, would the one be the most important is the one that passes most of their genetic makeup to <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to say something stupid. Do you understand my question? I really I'm wish just you'd wondering check out if the outline genetics, before you started. What, yeah. You know, the cock of the hen, whatever one passes on their genetic makeup to their offspring, would that be the most important? It, obviously, that's true. Bird? But it's not about just passing the genetic makeup. It's how they pass it. Yeah. It's how they pass okay. it. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was trying to get to, but I wasn't doing very well. But the okay. next section actually goes into what Nancy's asking about actually. She has the outline in front of her. All she has to do is look it over. <laughs> <laughs> She's busy though, Kenny. She's done all your work for you. And I put the outline that- <laughs> right in front of her too, you know? So <laughs> that would just make too much sense. Sorry. It was a long day. <laughs> Continue. I agree. I agree with you there. Okay. Continue. So let's talk about the pros, the favorable aspects of the cock, and then we'll move on to the hen. So the cocks, they represent beauty, Frank, plumage and personality. You got to admit, they're striking. They really get people's attention. That's true. 
pretty much all the feathered birds, chickens, wild birds, pretty much any type of birds you can have. The male's always the bright colored and beautiful and just majestic as they can be. And the hens are just, oh, blah. Yeah. Plain. yeah, but blue blah. And I think that's what everybody's attracted to, Kenny. They look at the beauty of the cock and they think that's where they should be focusing all their time because that's what they want to see in the offspring that they're getting. So if yeah. I've got this beautiful cock, all they have got to do is just breed him to this old plain Jane hen, and that's what I'm going to get. So I think we get, I guess you say, tunnel vision when it comes to breeding, just in the beauty of the cocks. I used to do the same thing when I was a kid. Give me 10 hens or give me one good-looking rooster. I would have took the rooster any day of the week. We always say follow Mother Nature, and it's this way in nature, too. If you look at birds, it's always the male that's the most beautiful, the most striking, the most colorful, that has the most personality. But the female, the hen in our case, has to be kind of low-keyed in such a way so she stays when she's sitting on her egg. She's camouflaged. She's quiet. The cock is about getting the attention, but the hen is about survival. So point, I understand. Yeah. The, she's got to blend into her environment. That's right. Yes. More than the yeah. cock does, yeah. And yeah. when we see how different the cock is, the fact that they're sexually dimorphic, we see, and it happens with chickens if you let them, that sexual selection plays a role in why they have the color, why they have the personality that they have. So the hen actually, in a lot of ways in the wild especially, are selecting the males to breed to. So I don't want to talk about the hen too much right now because we're going to get into it, but you can see the level of intelligence that goes on there to select the right mate with a cock. He's just mating whatever is in front of him. Okay, I don't call that smart. But when we look at breeders, <laughs> the, <laughs> I just insulted my own kind, didn't I? Pretty much. But, but when you look at most breeders, the rooster, the cock, is everything to these guys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They base everything on the, the looks of the cock. Well, he's got to have the looks because he's a protector. If something comes in and attacks one of those hens, he's there to protect them, to get in between whatever it is. They'll give their life for their harem in a split second. That's what really attracted me to the game fowl because any old chicken will protect its harem, but a game bird will be there regardless of what it is. You attack his family, he's going to attack back. Either way, he's going to protect all of his hens regardless of the age, size, what they are. And with that comes the beautiful colors, the majestic look, the personality. But with the hen, just like Kenny said, could you imagine her being the color of the cock and trying to stay camouflaged? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she'd be uh, toast. They wouldn't last very long at all. They wouldn't last very long at all that way. When you look at the, you know, we're still talking about the pros of the cock, and we're going to talk about the counter side of this, is the cock has a much longer reproductive life. As long as he's fertile and he mm -hmm. represents his breed and he has all the qualities you are looking for, as long as he's fertile, he can be bred forever until he can't produce anything anymore. With a hen, she has a much shorter reproductive life. And the longer you push that reproductive life, the worse the quality of the birds or her offspring will be. Yeah, Kenny, I have one that was two weeks from 14 years old, and he passed away sitting on the roost. And I just thought he was asleep and picked him up, <laughs> and rigor mortis had set in on him. He must have died in his sleep. But I was still hatching eggs off from this cock, and him been dead for two weeks, and I had eggs still hatching from him. So that just shows 14 years old. But the hen's not that lucky. She's born with the eggs that's in her body. And therefore, whatever her age is, is the age of those eggs. So I guess it varies to the breed and, and pretty much the individual itself. But a hen gets up five, six, seven years old. Usually she's on the decline going downhill. To For where some, a cock's still going yeah. good because he remakes his sperm as he uses it. So every day. he's got a little bit. Yeah, every day. So he's got an advantage on the hen as far as the reproductive end of it, so to speak. Yeah. For some hens, you're right. Five, six years is really the limit for some breeds. Mm -hmm. American games, you could probably go seven or eight years and be okay. Easy. You got to watch it, though, because the quality of the chicks, you start seeing lethargic chicks. They start not hatching. When they do, they're really slow going, unthrifty. We're talking about a hen who's pretty much reached the end of her reproductive life, and that's the time not to push it. So the quality of the chicks is going to be the real indication of whether you keep using that hen or not. And a lot of people, they don't see those indications. They just start blaming on other things, disease. Kenny, uh, remember the birds that I had? They were born dubbed. They didn't have, oh, yeah. didn't have comb. 
That was out of an 11-year-old cock and a 10-year-old hen. A pullet and two of the cockerels hatched out without combs. They had the ear lobes, they had the wattles, but they didn't have the comb. Yeah. And I think that was a lot to do with it. I think it, it was something to do with the, that age. Oh, you think so? Could have been. Mm-hmm. I think so. Mm-hmm. Because I never had it happen in any other chickens except those. The hen would lay an egg maybe once a week, once every seven to eight days. But I didn't have it happen until that age. I could be wrong. It could have just been something in the genome that just made it do that. But I thought maybe it could have been the age of the chickens as well. So, But I am going to bring them back to see if I can get it to reoccur again. I am going to try that. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. So the next thing would be when you're creating a strain or trying to improve the strain, you need a lot less, especially in certain stages of your breeding program, you need a lot less roosters, a lot less cocks to make it happen. Yeah. And that's the nice thing. But it's still the quality of the bird that really counts. But I've seen some people create really nice strains with a lot less males and having just really key females. Well, in a pure family, you're not going to need all that diversity That's coming right. in there. That's true. You, you crank it down, you know, you tighten that gene pool up, and the less males, the better, I think. Well, and I think that's where a lot of people fail is when they have so many males, they think they got to breed them all instead of breeding the key birds, the ones mm-hmm. that can actually advance the strain. Okay, so let's go into the cons, the less favorable aspects of the cock, which aren't huge, but they're considerations. And we talked a little bit about it a second ago, and that is the cock basically has one job, to fertilize the eggs. Once he's done, he's done, and it becomes the hen's job to do the rest. So in a proper breeding program, having a really healthy, fertile cock is what you need, but that's all he's required to do when you think about it. Here's how I look at it, Kenny. As far as temperament issues, a man fighter, as soon as I see that's in that bird, that is a definite no to me. Now, back years ago, I would try to gentle them down, work with them. Usually when they're like that, even if you gentle them down, their offspring's going to be the same way. It's more of a mental issue, I think, than it is anything. But as far as temperament, I want my birds to be as docile, gentle as they can be. I'm over that biting and picking and going around with my arms bleeding all the time. I'm not going to do it. You shouldn't have to. You shouldn't. Exactly, yeah, Nancy. You, you, sh- you shouldn't have to. We, we put so much time in these birds, and we're so good to them, and you get them out, and the only thing they want to do is beat on you. Nah, I'm not having it. That will get one cold in, 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 on my yard and a snap of a finger. There's a difference in pecking you out of being scared or not being handled that much than pulling a piece of meat off and eating it or stand there with it in their bill. I'm not going to put up with that. I'm just not going to do it. Okay, then let me ask you this. What if it's a perfect bird otherwise? If it's the only bird I got, I will breed him in the time comes and work my way through it to where I'm getting it bred to where I'm getting the more gentle birds out of them. If it's a have to, but as soon as I get to where I need to be, he's getting a hatchet. Is that a genetic thing? Well, it can be, or it can be learned too. It can, it can be a learned yeah. behavior. Oh, okay. Okay. You, you could not handle them right, be rough with them. You can take a, a docile bird and turn it into a man fighter in very short time. Okay. Nancy okay. brings up a really good question there. So if I have a bird that has all the desirable traits, he represents its breed, really good type, really good conformation, really good color, has everything I'm looking for, but he's a man fighter. So then I got to look at him, compare him to all the other roosters and cocks on my yard, and I determine, is it worth moving forward with it? Is he that good that I need to work with him? And Frank was right on the money in that if he's that good, then you got to know how to breed him and select and move forward in a way that you're taking advantage of him, but you're moving away from the man fighter trait too. And we teach that in the Breeders Academy. So yes, there's a way to do it, but if you're not selecting properly and moving forward with the right offspring, then you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because you're just not going to go anywhere. And then before you know it, your whole farm is full of man fighters. So that's a consideration in that when I've got a bird that good and he's a man fighter, do I work with him or not? And if you know how to do it, I think you do. But he's got to be that good. He's got to be much better than all the cocks on your yard because I wouldn't put up with him if I have one that's better than him for sure. I broke one cock one time by doing that. And he really wouldn't fight you, but when you'd get him up in your arms, he would peck you. Not hard, not enough to make you bleed or anything, but just peck you. So I got this big bright idea. I went in and I cut me a half lime in two, and I put Don Dishwasher liquid all over the top of it. So I'd hold my hand up, and next time he would bite, he'd get a bite of that. 
Let me tell you something. That broke him really fast. I didn't have any. That's a good idea. He wasn't a man fighter, though. You set him down on the ground, he wouldn't come to you to fight you. He would go away from you, you know. But matter of fact, Kenny, it was one I showed you in the pen up there. And he really wasn't a man fighter. And to this day, I can get him out, pick him up. He's fine. But that's the only one. And he was that nasty. He was that perfect bird. So I wanted to try to give him a chance. Now, I did raise some offspring out of him. So I guess we'll wait and see. If they're like that, and if they are, I'll discontinue him and the offspring itself because I'm too old. My skin's too thin to put up with that crap. Yeah, I I agree. So if you look at the difference between a genetically made man fighter versus a learned behavior, can you fix it genetically? Yeah. Uh, You can, by selection, improve them knowing what to do. And there's some real no-nos. Well, when we talk about the Breeders' Academy, remind me, and I can bring it up again inside the back end. There's some things you could do that just would work totally against you. And then there's some things you can do that actually move you forward. And then learn behavior. It's just a matter of taming them down, matching them to the right hand, for sure. You'll get by it real quick. If they're that good, I would, I would definitely give them a chance. Selection this, take you a long ways. Yeah. Would, no no one person to select, too. Would mm-hmm. this be a question we would ask on the back end? Breed to him, then yeah. breed to the hen side if the hen is docile. Yeah, that's good. But there's more to it than that. Yeah. Okay. He's yeah. leaving one key element out. That's part of it. That's Big part, part of, of it. it. Okay. But he's leaving so a very important talk. component out. But he's got the ideal. He does. Yeah. That one key component is a big part of it. Because if he yeah. doesn't do that, then what he's talking about doesn't work. So the cons about the cock is if you like to crane a strain, you're heading your lines with the cock. It takes a lot longer to create the strain when you've got to wait for the hens to mature because there's a lot of issues with breeding the pullets. And the hen is a lot quicker, especially if you understand the family, you understand what you're getting from year to year. You can actually breed a mature hen to her young son and move on really quickly because the, his age isn't a factor, whereas a pullet bred to a mature cock is a huge factor. So that would be a con for me. I agree. Yeah. The only other thing is... Depending on where you live and your neighbors and the zoning laws and the noise, that could be an issue. That could be a huge con depending on you, your neighbors, your location. That's something you have to deal with. So That's what got me in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Too much crowing going on. It was okay. I cut back there for, I don't know, five, six years. And I got a wild hair and just started breeding more and more and more and more and more, more, really working on them. And I got a nice letter from the city. So I had to to bump them up and relocate them back to where I originally was. But hopefully we've got our farm and it's out in the country. So we get them moved up there. We won't have any more problem. It's nice just to go and hear them crow. But me and Amanda was up there yesterday feeding and we just got there and they was all happy and everything. She was standing in front of me, and neither of us could hear the other one, what the other one was saying. Just wasn't a crowing going on, okay? Mm-hmm. So I could see that. But if somebody's not into chickens, you take 75 to 100 chickens, that's not going to be a pleasant sound. I'll tell you one thing, though, is when I used to bring new birds on my farm a lot, move birds in and out, there was a lot more crowing around here. But since I've raised one family, they all know each other. There's never really any new birds other than what I hatch, and they grow up gradually. You've seen it. Look how many roosters I have here. There's not a lot of crowing going on here because it there's was, no challenge. There was a lot of crowing. They all know each other. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mine start around midnight. For some reason, they break loose at midnight. They go through this crowing phase, and then about 4 o'clock in the morning, they do it again. And then when the sun comes up, it's just crazy. As soon as it breaks dawn and, and it's starting to get light, when they come off the roof, it's just it, it is crazy, but I move mine a lot. So they're constantly seeing someone new about every two weeks, so it yeah. keeps them riled up and going, you know. Okay, so let's move on to the hen. And we talked about this a second ago, is that a lot of people, they believe that the hen is important, but they don't know why. They never took the time to figure out why. And we're going to dive into that quite a bit here, especially on the back end. But this kind of thinking, I know the hen is important, but I don't know why. How do you create a strain when you don't really know what bird you're actually selecting and why? Because knowing that the hen is important is a major part of it, and knowing which hens to select and which one's not makes all the difference. So if I'm selecting the hen because I think she's better than the cock overall, it's not just that. It's knowing which hen to select because they're not all equal. 
I always find that interesting that they believe it's the him, but they don't know why. Well, Kenny, this goes in a lot of things that we talk about each day, me and you. Okay. If you ask 10 people, you'll usually get 10 different answers. And you said it. I don't know how anybody can or could create a strain without knowing the importance of the cock in the hen. You said it a while ago. You're shooting yourself in the foot. If you're focusing only on the cock and not the hen or the hen and not the cock, then you're just going to be one-sided in the whole equation. Yeah. So it's not going to work out at all. If you're not selecting the right hen, it's not just a matter of selecting the hen. It's selecting the right hen. Your ability to improve that strain just became harder. You're back to where you were before. It's all a matter of luck. So if we talk about the favorable aspects of the hen, I wanted to start with this because I think it's amazing. If you look at the old dead man books that we have, whether it's a domestic chicken book, a commercial book, or even a, a game fowl book, they all kind of have the same idea, and that is the cock crows, but the hen lays the egg. Which the cock, he makes a lot of noise, he's very pretty, he's uh, exciting to watch, and he gets all the attention. But it's the hen that matters so much because of reproductive value. The fact that she's actually the one laying the eggs, hatching the baby chicks, growing them out. The success of that strain is dependent on her way more than the cock overall. You hit the money on the head. The thing about it is with a hen, how many people have we had, Kenny? And I won't go far into this, but as soon as the hen starts laying, they throw her in the brood pen. I mean, as soon as she lays her first egg, they throw her in the brood pen. And to me and you, that's a mistake. But it's done so many times over the years that they're tickled to death because the hen's laying an egg because they want to breed them just as soon as possible. They don't wait till the hen to get to her maturity. And anybody could take a hen and breed her as a pullet, and breed her as a mature hen, and I promise you, you're going to get so much better results out of a mature hen as you will a pullet. But a lot of people doesn't believe that. And what happens? Gradually, generation after generation doing that, the strain gets smaller and smaller, so they start blaming it on inbreeding. Inbreeding. Yeah, inbreeding. <laughs> yeah. And, you you uh, want to clarify that as to why it gets smaller and smaller? Because you're talking about a pullet. Lay smaller eggs, produce smaller right. chicks. They don't always catch up to the size of the other birds. A lot of times they're selecting hens that are pullets. They haven't shown their worth yet to survive their environment, to live beyond diseases. A lot of times they're not at their full size. So you don't even know whether you selected the right hen because by the time they become 18 months to two years old, they could be a completely different bird than they were as a pullet completely different sizes as as well, and you're selecting Mm -hmm. birds as pullets, you don't really know that much about the bird. What that bird ends up turning out as it gets older could be completely different than you thought, and in the meantime, you went in the wrong direction. And I know some people, they swear on it. I breed the pullets every single year, and then they don't know why their strain went in the wrong direction, got smaller, and they blame it on inbreeding, which they really didn't do that much inbreeding. Chickens can take a lot of inbreeding before you start experiencing inbreeding depression. A lot. You just don't blame size on inbreeding. Well, it's a proven science fact, Kenny and Nancy, that you breed young, immature hens, you will have a higher uh, mortality rate yeah. in your offspring, your chicks. That's a proven fact. I've had that happen before myself. Breed pullets, you'd lose more of them than you would than breeding a, a mature hen. It's just fact. She's not fully developed yet. She's not where she needs to be to do that. So us as breeders can hurt it too fast. And that's one thing that we kind of hold our members back on. We know they're just getting in this started. They don't want to wait that extra year for that hen mature, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it to wait that extra year. Yeah, they haven't proven themselves health-wise, genetically, physically, nothing. They haven't yes. proved anything to you. And they can change so much from the time they're a pullet to the time they're fully mature. That's the way you look at any animal, though. You look at it and it's young, its younger years can be beautiful, be perfect in every way. But the time it matures, you're like, oh, God, what is this? That's not even the same hen. I've seen this so many times. Take out and think you have a, a beautiful pullet. She's all this and that. But the time she matures, you're not even interested in her anymore. She's totally opposite of what you thought she was. Well, Jason brings up a good point, too, is, is she may not even be broody. Some pullets if aren't you- great setters. It's, it's not something I would judge them as a pullet. Um, That's more of an issue if I'm always using incubators and not using hens at all for setting. Now, what you could do, and I don't don't have a problem with this, is using pullets as um, foster hens. You could be taking a risk that she may not stay in the nest the whole time. She may leave the nest halfway through. She may not take care of the chicks. She may even kill the chicks. Who knows? 
it's something good to know. It might give you a little hindsight on what that pull it's all about. But for the most part, if I'm trying to get the most out of the hen, using pullets as foster hens when I'm not going to be using them for anything else for a while, I don't have a problem with that at all. You nailed that one, Kenny. I've had really bad luck with pullets doing that because, like you said, they'll go through and be up on a week, 12, 13 days, and just get up and walk off the nest and yeah, never go back. I've seen that many or times. Or they're mm-hmm. off and on. They'll go off and on, off and on. Or they bust their eggs. They're messy. They destroy their whole clutch eggs or they bust so many. Many different things can go on with it. But a mature hen, that's not to mean that she's going to be any better when she gets older, but I think you've got a better chance, a higher percentage of having a better quality offspring with a mature hen. Science proves that over and over again. Yeah, pullets are just unreliable for the most part, too. Very unreliable. What's Rob saying, Nancy? Well, Rob is asking, is that just the egg size of the pullet hurting the survivability of the chick? I don't think so. It's more about her proving herself as far as disease resistance, surviving her environment, the ability to pass maternal antibodies to the baby chick. The size of the baby chick, we're talking about pullet eggs that are pretty small. They could be sometimes half the size of a hen egg. That's going to affect the size of the flock or the strain overall over time. You're going to see a difference in them if you're not careful. And I've had people swear by that. I got attacked one time. I wrote a, a small article and put it in one of the groups. And people was like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I can take my chicken's lay egg. It looks like a fairy egg from a pullet and it'll grow up to be a seven-pound <laughs> cop. So you, you, you can't get ahead of some of these people. You try to put it out there to help some people and then you've got people that uh, just shoot it down just to be shooting it down i guess but there's people that swears they breed their pullets and never have a problem i can't say that i've done this all my life i'm 53 years old and i've never had what you say success out of breeding pullets ever now this is opinion but i put a lot of stock in it just the fact and it's obvious but just the fact that the hen goes to not the trouble, but her instincts are to protect the baby chicks. The close connection she has with the baby chicks and the fact that she cares for them and raises them until they're weaned, it's such a connection to nature. It just shows me that she does something that the cock doesn't. And to me, that makes her more valuable just for the fact that she's able to do that, something that the cock can't. That's not hard science that makes her better than him, but I think it's a major factor for me. I put that on a high pedestal, I guess you could say. And guys, Jason had this question, but I think we was going to discuss this on the Yeah, the we're going to discuss that on right. the back end. Okay. Mm-hmm. We wasn't ignoring you, Jason. We we're just going to do it on the second part. Just make sure you ask me on the back end so we don't miss it. So it looks like we will be having the answer to that question, who is more important, the cock or the hen, on the back end in the VIP members only part of the show, as well as the benefits of breeding to youth and quality of offspring genetic factors we'll be discussing on the back end sex leak genes in hemogosity did i say that right of the hen you know i have a list for you already made up just scan i know that but hemogosity just kind of that's a long word let's see is that what i wrote no i didn't write that okay here's a list that should have read so that you guys know (laughs) <laughs> She's got to look over the outline, I'm telling you. I'm reading it off the outline. Uh, no, I set it up for you. Okay, topic for the members-only version is why the hen is three-quarters of every breeding, the benefits of breeding to youth, and the genetic factors considering the hen, and mitochondrial DNA. That's the kind of things we're going to talk about in the back. So we didn't yep. get as far into the outline as I was hoping for the front end, but we'll cover it on the back end because there's a lot of good things about the hen that I want to cover. Anything you guys want to say? Give me a little lead because I got to get ready for the back end. Well, I was trying to, but you wouldn't let me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm using training, right? I've got to use my phone for the outline (laughs) because I bring something up with the screen. I can't see it where it's so small. So I have to use my phone for that. Yeah, well, I've got a good version of the outline here. It's nice and big. Now I don't have to use the phone anymore. It should be uh, plenty big. There's some really good subject matter that we're going to be discussing in the VIP area. And we've had some really good questions in here. So make sure you guys come over and ask them on the other uh, part of the show. So that was really good. Yeah. And we got some really good material to cover. So let's get in there. So 
for those who want to become a member, who want to get the whole show, make sure you join the Breers Academy. Just go to www.breersacademy.com, hit the registration page, join. You're going to love the information in there. Plus, like I said, you're going to get the whole show. For members, join us for the back end, and we'll talk with you guys in a few minutes. See you then. See ya. Hey, guys. Okay, thanks for listening. Yes, thank you again for joining us on the Breck Perfection Podcast Show. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where by becoming a member, you can increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and take you and your fowl to the next level. We can also show you how to create a strain from hybrid crosses or mongrel flocks and help you to create, maintain, and improve your present strains. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel anytime. To join us at the Breeders Academy membership website, go to www.breedersacademy.com. Best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. While you're checking out the Breeders Academy, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, The Breeders Bulletin. We provide a lot of free bonus materials and some great information that will take you and your fowl to the next level. Well, that's it for now. We hope you join us next time for another episode of Bread to Perfection. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.